Dzień dobry Państwu. Witamy Państwa w Gdańskim Uniwersytecie Medycznym. Welcome to the Gdańsk Medical University at our debate Culture of Respect. This is being delivered with the support of the Marshal's Office for the Pomorski Regions uh, since October 2020. And now I would like to invite Professor Jacek Bigda, who is Vice Rector for Development and Education. Please um, welcome um, everyone on behalf of the Gdansk Medical University. Yes, hello everyone. A very warm welcome to Ewa Jagodzińska, who is the manager of the department at the Marshal's Office Pomorskie Region. And that office is the co-organizer of the campaign and the debate today. I'd like to welcome representatives of the universities in Pomorskie, especially those involved in the study in Pomorskie Region, representatives for equal treatment support for migrants, and a very warm welcome to the students and members of staff of the Medical University of Gdańsk and other universities of the Pomorskie region. A very warm welcome to everyone following us at the debate online. And you, so you can follow this on YouTube, um, the channel of the university. A very warm welcome to all the speakers, and I hope I'm not in the way of anyone here. We have experts, authorities, researchers, and practitioners in the area that we will be discussing today. We also have activists who work in areas that are so important for our day-to-day -day work and will uh, learn more about their background from Dr. Kaczmarek. And also I want to take this opportunity and say thank you to the co-organizers of this debate, but they are also very important for this culture, for this debate, the culture of re uh, respect. And we've... Um, organized this uh, mainly thanks to three people. That's Eva Kiszka, who's the manager of our international department, Anna Śliwińska, who's the head of our communications team, and Dr. Jacek Kaczmarek. And they work together with their teams uh, involved. So thank you very much for that. And I hope you'll be able to keep this up um, as we continue our work in the years to come. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Rector. And now I'd like to um, invite Ewa Jagodzińska to say a few words of welcome. She's the department. She's the manager of the Department for Development, Pomorski Marshal's Office, which is the co-organizer for today's debate. Yes, hello, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. I'm really delighted, I'm happy, and I'm honored to be able to speak to you on behalf of Mieczysław Struk, who's the Marshal of Pomorskie, and I'm happy to be able to welcome you on behalf um, of, the, of everyone involved in the debate. The authorities, from the very beginning, have been supporting this initiative the local um, authority uh, level has been very supportive of this initiative, and it was first uh, developed here at the Medical University of Gdansk, and it's no surprise because of the multiple uh, cultures you represent here. And I think it's clear to everyone that this is a necessary and press initiative because it teaches respect and dignity for everyone. And individual, all individuals are important, and dignity is an intrinsic feature of everyone, regardless of your race, education, or background. Human dignity is also an important element of social order, and respect is important to protect um, the individual. And respect is um, the, the key to all the other moral values. And now quickly, about um, other topics. Well, as part of what we do, um, the regional government is also supportive of mutual understanding and respect among the people of Pomorskie, which includes those that were born here and those who are newcomers, but they've picked this place as their place on earth. 
The best known example of what we do is the integration policy of Pomorskie, represented here by my colleague. And we have tasks such as a friendly office, inclusive school, or open library. But I think everyone understands that there is still so much to do, not just at the regional level or the institutional or university level. When we look at what's happening at the Polish-Russian border, it's clear that there is so much to be done across the country. And if I may, I'd like to finish this short introduction with a quote from Franco Scalia, who wrote, Two nations that want to defend their culture and history don't need barbed wire. They need mutual respect. This is a boundary not to be exceeded, which is determined by awareness and knowledge. And I think the debate today will help with that, which is to reinforce our awareness and improve our knowledge. Thank you very much. Thank you. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you our speakers who are kind enough to participate in today's debate. We have Professor Jacek Bigda, who is Vice Rector for Development Education, Medical University of Gdansk, formerly Dean and Vice Dean of the Intercollegiate Faculty of Biotechnology, University of Gdansk and Medical University of Gdansk, academic teacher 30 for 35 years. Mr. Dariusz Bogalski, who is the author of the K3 podcast about good life, a journalist, university lecturer in effective communication, a poet, writer, public speaker, promoter of values and quality um, and culture. Professor Wiesław Łukaszewski, psychology professor, researcher of problems such as social psychology, including the perception of differences and similarities between people. The author of some 20 books and many scientific papers, lecture, popularizer of psychology, member of editorial boards of several scientific journals on psychology. Uh, Reverend Dr. Krzysztof Niedałtowski, a theologist and scholar of religion, rector of St. John's Parish in Gdańsk, lecturer on re religiology, priest of the artist community, social activist, co-creator of Radio Plus radio station and Gdańsk Aeropak, chairman of the editorial group for Karta Powinności Człowieka, Charter of Human Obligations, President of Proarta Sakra Foundation, member of Dice Council for Equal Treatment, second term 2021-25. Marta Siciarek, coordinator of the Regional Migration Policy at the Marshal's Office, Pomeranian Voivodeship, member of the Team for Human Rights at the European Union Agency for Fundamental Rights, graduate of Sinology and Cross-Cultural Psychology co-creator and former chairperson at the Immigrant Support Center in Gdansk. Ms. Eva Maria Sokolewicz, student of the sixth year, English Division, Faculty of Medicine, Medical University of Gdansk, chairperson of the Student Scientific Group of Dermatology, English Division, co-author and co-organizer of annual editions of the Shameless Conference. A very warm welcome to everyone. Thank you for being here, for uh, being ready to share your thoughts and experience about this important topic, which is respect. And now let's start with the debate. Over to the moderator, that's Mr. Dariusz Bogalski. Thank you, doctor. Thank you very much for having me. I consider it a great honor, and I appreciate um, the ability to meet with you. And again, I'm really happy that we'll be discussing something really important and underappreciated, and that's respect. Let me begin with a few words of introduction, and then I'm going to hand it over to you. Well, take a look at this. I'm holding this book in my hand. Six lesser values, virtues. This is about the lesser virtues. It was written by three philosophers from the Nicholas Copernicus University. One such lesser virtue is respect. And I was really surprised. How come a lesser virtue? Well, maybe what they mean is that it's lesser in Poland, underappreciated, because we do have a deficit of respect. That's what I believe. And so I appreciate the fact that we can now talk with people who work towards 
the culture of respect. So here's the procedure we're going to follow. We'll begin, each of us, uh, with a short contribution, three minutes. Uh, in your intervention, please explain what the meaning of respect is from our professional perspective. And then we'll aim at some sort of a diagnosis. This will take a bit longer, 30 to 35 minutes. And then, because this is the Medical University of Gdansk, so we will be discussing perhaps some medical issues. And uh, that's why we are using medical terminology. So we are going to talk about the perspectives, how likely it is that we can improve this. So we are going to talk about resources and hopes. Where are the opportunities? And then therapy. We'll have 15 minutes um, each for the sessions, and then we are going to have a Q&A session. Let me begin. Um, first, and then we'll have a go at this. No specific sequence. We'll see who will be willing to, sp to speak first. So that's what we're going to do. So from my professional perspective, respect is something like this. Let's say I'm uh, I'm talking to someone. Initially, it was um, the, the third program, and now I run my own podcast. So to me, uh, respect is like this. It's not dialogue, it's something else. Let me explain. I mean, in formal terms, it's a dialogue. It's a conversation, but dialogues can take different forms. This could be a monologue that pretends to be a dialogue, like... Mr. MP, you were speaking and I didn't interrupt you, with different variations. Or it could be something like this. Let's invite someone like Zbigniew Ziobro and Donald Tusk. And then we ask them any question and we already have a spectacle of hatred, right? And then we get a sense that we don't really know what they were talking about, but we definitely know they hate each other. Well, it doesn't matter what the names are. It could be accidental or not. There is another opportunity. You invite someone and you talk to them like this. You and I, Master, we are great. But the people listening to us, they are just there as a compliment. We don't really need them. And um, finally, the dialogue that I consider true dialogue, but in fact it's a trialogue. Um, excuse the, uh, the new word. The way it works, I talk to someone and I have to have that sense and conviction that there's a third person or third persons that's listeners. Maybe a, this could be a banal or a cliche, but uh, think about an experiment, like listen to an exper listen to an interview on radio or television, and I'm sure you will know soon whether the interviewer knows where the listeners are or not. Is it like Agnieszka from Dansk? Obviously, we don't get to see her, but she's there. It does come at a cost. The currency would be like this. I talked to Eva Bem, and I love her. And I um, and I respect her. No, what, back then people didn't know what a cover is. A cover is a version of an existing song. And so I said, Eva. So we are now recording a cover, which is a version of an existing song. And I remember her look. She was both astonished, but also sort of uh, not very happy or. She doubtful about my mental capacity, and she said, listen, I know what a cover means. Yes, but I didn't say that because I thought she didn't know what that meant. I was, in fact, considering Agnieszka or anybody else that I thought was listening to us. So that, to me, is respect. So that's my approach to things. End of my round, over to you. What is respect from your perspective, professionally and just from a personal point of view? Three minutes. I think we have Professor Łukaszewski willing to speak. <coughs> My thoughts are that respect can be or should be understood as the ability to consider someone else's opinion. 
taking into account uh, their values and people's convictions. And to consider them doesn't mean um, giving in to them. But there is a lesson of respect that I was given 50 years ago, more or less. Uh, that he was my tutor, the great Professor Tamaszewski. Perhaps overly motivated and overly certain that I'm right, whatever the conversation is. So I was absolutely sure that I was right. And I was uh, criticizing vehemently different uh, renowned scholars. And then Professor Tamaszewski looked at me and he said this. Well, you know, it doesn't really matter whether they are right or not. But what does matter is that they may be right. So think about this. Assume that they are right, not you. It's them who are right. Now think what the consequence of that would be. And that's a lesson that I've been carrying with me for some 50 years or so. And every time I come across a view that's alien to me, this is what I get in my head. The voice of Professor Tomaszewski. Think about it. It's very likely that they are right. I mean, there are two pillars to respect. Pillar one is freedom, freedom of choice. You cannot force anyone to be respectful. Respect is always um, a choice. It's, it's your free will to do, to feel this. The second pillar is the ability to tolerate diversity, but true tolerance. It's not tolerance like, yes, but. I mean, it's okay for them to have their life, but let's, uh, that they should stay behind. Now, so these two pillars are the, will determine whether we have that ability or not. Thank you. Who's next? We don't have to um, keep this sequence, but it's just as well. Yes, thank you for having me. Um, I recently met some friends who work on the border, and um, so they, they do the work that the Polish state is not doing. And there was a question. We had a discussion. Why are you working for the public office in the first place? I mean, where did you get the idea from? So the first answer uh, is that uh, when you provide help, it should be invisible. And, and this is why I work for the marshal's office. Respect is the ability to consider other people's values. So to me, respect is a systemic-based ability to deal with people's needs, emotions, situations, and also to uh, wrap this with some procedures and a system that gives people autonomy, that empowers people, where you don't have to wait until someone mercifully helps you. It's about instincts, feeling, uh, providing um, help. Uh, so from where I'm standing, from my perspective, what really matters is to build a culture of social inclusion. Uh, I focus on migrants, but it's even in a broader set where people it's, it's like an invisible thing that I do, but to make people feel respected. So I understand that the systemic value, this is something what you are going to tell us, because, well, we'll uh, listen to it. Yeah, now, who now? Okay, so we are going just in the sitting order. It's like, as, like in sport, like in cyclists, you give a change. So it's... Uh, now it's a change, but we don't need to uh, to race, luckily. Well, referring to what Professor has said, it inspired me, really. And when I think about respect, then this principle that imagine that you're, um, uh, that this person, uh, the other person may be right, this is the fundament, really. It's the very beginning. It's an introduction to the fact that we are not the wisest person in the world. We will not impose our opinions. 
And I want to uh, refer to what Professor uh, Priest Tischner has once said when he analyzed the phenomenological situation that the father will prove to the son that the father was right because they have the authority, they have power, they have experience, uh, well, power, of course. And he says, well, why, what's, what's then that um, the father uh, proves that he's right and the boy will be forced to admit it uh, sincerely or unsincerely, but this son will be pushed, will be, uh, this authority will be really uh, uh, damaged. So never ask whether you're right, because not the not to be right is what really counts, but ask what good will come out of it. Because even if you let it go for a while, if you uh, step back from your right, then it's then you will be more inclusive. You'll have respect to this young person because this young person will have time. Uh, he may start from a different position, but he may come with new and maybe weaker uh, positions. There's great, great thing in our disputes in public or pr in private. Never ask who's right, because the right should not go first, but what good comes from that? It's a difficult ethical question. And it might be, uh, we may be accused that we make the image more blur, but we have the other image coming from that. We had this uh, commission for the communist uh, crimes, and in many cases it was, uh, we, we saw lack of uh, respect. I asked ambassador of, Repub of uh, South Africa in Poland at that time, how they coped with that, because the situation was even worse in upper type times. The situation was much worse compared to our communist times. And she replied, I don't want to criticize anything, but we have established a commission of truth and reconciliation, and you have only the commission of truth. And that's the very essence of it. Well, if you prove someone that you're right, if you put this person in prison, this person will never be restored. This person will never get integrated with the society. And when we say the truth and reconciliation, we want to show the truth, but also we say, we give you this gauge, you can come back to us if you understand your mistake, if you want to be with us, then out of respect to you, respect to your dignity, you can be with us. Well, I assume that now it would be my turn to say something. When this question was asked to me, then in my head, I have two words and two uh, punctuation. When the first thing was monologue, full stop, and equality, a question, interrogation mark. So the monologue, well, we heard about the dialogue and trialogue. Well, monologue seemed more um, fit for the purpose. And this monologue, which we have with ourselves, well, we may show the respect not only towards another person, but also to ourselves. On the other side, the monologue seemed more fit to me as, well, should respect depend on how the other person will treat us in the conversation, irrespective of uh, the other person treating us right or wrong in the right or wrong way. We should keep to a certain form. We should still keep on showing respect, which is why I believe that this monologue should end with the uh, full stop. The other notion which came to my mind was um, equality. And why interrogation mark? Well, it seemed obvious, uh, equality towards women, English division students and Polish division students, towards um, individuals. And also we have, uh, we see an elderly person in a tramway, then we don't think about equality, but we think that this is an elderly person and our gesture of showing this person respect is to say, well, you, we should give way to this person. We should let her sit, for example. However, theoretically, we should believe all of us are equal, but showing respect is also about providing a different approach to different people, like this elderly person in a tramway. So, um, 
What I wanted to say that monologue, a full stop, and uh, equality, the interrogation mark. Thank you very much. It was uh, Maria Sokolevich. So now over to uh, you, Professor. Well, I look from the perspective of my teaching at the university, we think why we are talking about the culture of respect while it's about culture. The most valuable uh, habits, our behaviors, which you want to transfer from generation to generation. It kind of goes without saying where we talk about the culture of respect in a community of the university. Well, mainly because we try to, um, to create a university community of different people. And also because the world is changing, the universities are changing, our university has changed a lot in the recent years. So it means that we should be open also to communities other than before. And having also in mind that we are now an international community. And the process of teaching is very important not only to provide content in the right way so that the, so that the content is understood and maybe analyzed and maybe create something on it and also and to communicate it but also it is important to uh, create right um, atmosphere wood for work in the community a smaller bigger group community but we uh, so that we can operate equally um, at the university and then we might be having problems with acceptance for what's different than we are. And uh, that's why we have this campaign. While referring to every individual, what's really most important is what Eva said, that we should have within us unconditional acceptance to other person, and thus we'll be having respect coming from it. Respect to everybody who is in our who sh, uh, who, who, um, who is close to us, and now referring to why we are sitting here, I uh, started to understand the reason of this debate at the medical university. I will talk about it later also, but um, it's a very special place because via cooperation in the group uh, with teachers, we receive some uh, uh, patterns or we, we want to follow some role models. And um, the medical profession is very special and it's important to understand how we create respect. So when we show, when we look at a person, a teacher, who uh, is um, who is uh, behaving in a certain way, and we see how this teacher responds to a person who is in a very difficult situation, maybe has a um, difficult uh, disease, so we should transfer such behaviors towards people who are suffering. So there are several reasons why we talk about respect here. The respect, which should be an obvious thing to all of us on a daily basis. And it's really difficult to define it. I remember once at a, at a lecture in anatomy, a professor, but it was explained to us how to define a glass. Well, difficult, because this description was incomprehensible, so it's better and easier to look at it or to start feeling it. Thank you. The second round now, we'll be talking, we'll try to come up with a kind of diagnosis. I'll begin, unless someone has, is energetic enough to do it. If not, then my question, may I use bad, a bad word? It will be a very bad word, word, but it's a story which I will want to tell you the story, and I have to, I have to say this word if I am to tell you the story. We will have two 
Uh, I will repeat it twice. And I remember once professor, I told the professor uh, Wukaszewski, I, I warned him that I would use a bad word, and Professor Wukaszewski explained that, well, I don't know bad words, so you will need to explain it to me. So this story will be at the end of my um, entry now. Well, professor said that it uh, seems so obvious what the respect is. We should not really try to define it. So I thought, what kind of culture we have in Poland? Culture of what? And it means, seems to me, well, I believe that in, in Poland we have a culture of respect, but it's a different respect. To me, respect is that it's the basic readiness to respect someone else, the presence of the other person and the different things about this person. It's the real respect. But the other respect is something that you have to deserve for. Who's, it's about who is more important, who is less in, uh, important. And in Poland, we have a culture of disrespect. My association is, I remember one um, one radio broadcasting and uh, someone uh, you could you could win a lot of money in a competition and there you should give a number and if you had the number then you would receive the money but um, people would not hit it uh, said too much or others said too little and you when you missed this number so it's either too much or too little and there is no middle so it's about fighting about status, who's more important. I know where it comes from. It might come from our feeling. I'll try from our narcissism, national narcissism. We have this notion in psychology, right? That we keep missing something. We want to be appreciated. We are bragging, but we think that it's some, that something's wrong. We don't have this feeling that it's enough, that it's okay. If it's enough for us, then it should be enough for others. Uh, so it was my um, diagnosis. And now my story, I warned you uh, about. It shows the very essence of the problem. Luckily, it's from Warsaw. I'm from Warsaw, not from Gdansk. Someone told me, and he told me that, it was, that it's true, that it's a true story. A railway station, Warsaw Wschodnia, now it's elegant, but it was really ugly. And in those ugly times, just imagine two gentlemen who would stand, they are drunk, and they um, are kind of fighting. They are grabbing uh, at each other, and they say, and one says to the other, you, you are not even a prick. And the other, fighting with the first one, says, what? I'm not a prick? And that's it. So again, the message is here that everybody is losing on it, as a matter of fact, right? So in the beginning, I will tell you what I said. What kind of diagnosis we should have? I think it's a deficit. If we didn't have deficit of respect, we wouldn't be meeting here if it were so obvious. Well, I don't think we can come up with a diagnosis within 15 minutes. I don't believe it. But you may try, of course. For years, I've been trying to find an answer to the question, where, why do we have this deficit of of respect in a culture, in our social life. And while looking for the answer, I came up with several. The first one is about the uh, mode of socialization in Poland. Socialization in Poland, and everybody would attend um, a kindergarten together with other kids or school, preschool, we saw it. It's about uh, mm, obeying others. It's not respect. It's, uh, it's about esteem. You have to listen to me. You have to obey me. But it's about obeying a god, a priest, a teacher, or your father, and so on and so forth. The other thing, 
is that it's over it's over estimation of liking in Polish social life liking is the fundament teacher is to like the pupil pupils and the pupils are to like the teacher patient is to like the patient but why why would we need to like people if they like that's nice but if they don't like well that's okay nothing bad really comes out of it but it's a condition of effective cooperation. It is made a condition of, of getting motivation to any kind of uh, action. You have to like someone. If we dislike ourselves, then uh, we are kind of cancelled. The third thing is over-focus on individual differences and neglecting differences and overvaluing. The other is not different. They are wiser or slimmer, worse or uh, better, useful or unuseful, and so on. In other words, the description is lost for valuing. And then it, we don't know what it is about. It's the third. Thing. And I have also, if you allow me to speak a bit longer now, if I speak too much, just tell me. You have used this word narcissism. We have two types of narcissism, an individual one and collective one. The individual one is so uh, popular that it really hurts. 80% of Pauls have very high self-esteem. Very high esteem, not high esteem. 80%. It's a miracle of nature. 80% of Pauls is thrilled with themselves. And 90% of Pauls believe that they are in the first tenth of percent. What else do we want? Briefly speaking, if I'm so wonderful, then others have to count with me and not the otherwise. Because the other people, they are not as wonderful as I am. The same goes for collective narcissists. We, the Pauls, we are golden birds, we are unique, we are wonderful, and others seem not to appreciate us enough. Which is why, what do we do? We don't like the others. We uh, don't. We give a damn about them. If they don't, if they don't know how to appreciate us. It means that they are unvaluable. And then the language. Just listen and read. Uh, it's uh, people uh, uh, write about humiliation, about destroying other people, and so on. This language of violence, which we have in Poland is uh, something so popular and also concluding I just want to say about revalization as fundamental way of organization of social life when in revalization and competition there is always someone who wins and the others who lose you don't like the winner you don't respect the losers. Okay, we may have an extra round later, but now it's your turn, please. Well, sources of the deficit. Um, I was wondering if you could speak more to the microphone. It's one thing uh, being able to hear you, but we have interpreters there as well. Okay, so um, rivalry and um, assuming a status in the relation of minority-majority, I suppose it's pretty obvious. And a lot of times, minorities are considered to be the worst character, where we can feel superior. And now, even in the British discourse, they talk about uh, creating minorities 
to exclude someone, to um, make them feel that they need our help, like we're merciful enough to help them. So in that sense, the Polish deficit, or perhaps it's more about our civilization, it seems we're slightly behind because we view people as those that have dignity, and dignity comes with rights, your fundamental rights, your human rights. If we took this perspective on one another, believing that we each have rights rather than a group of individuals, and then you have a higher status, you have a lower status, you drive a better car than me, etc. But if we saw each other through rights, and I suppose you can see it in my program as well, it's about rights at the local level. How do we make sure that we hold on to our rights where we live? So it's not just what happens at the border, it's not Guantanamo Bay, it's not just terrorism, it, it's also there in our day-to-day -day lives, economic and cultural rights that we deserve. So. A paradigm shift here in the philosophy of human rights, yes, it's more of a um, paradigm shift. You don't take the superior look at others like, I can help you, but I don't have to. In fact, we should see this from this perspective. Everyone has their rights, so we can better implement it through better programs or projects and to provide more inclusive institutions, such as a medical university, where people are fully recognized for who they are. There is dignity and respect. So that comes as an obvious thing then. How about if we change the sequence? So we're talking about diversity. Right, but I mean, having this order is just as, just as good. Right, I would like to talk about this diagnosis as an ethnologist and a, um, a scientist in ethics and re religion. When I explain to my students the difference between universal and ethnocentric ethics, then it's in fact two different worlds. So we have universal religions such as Christianity, Islam and Buddhism. They are open to everyone, like everyone come to me, go to the world and educate others. And we're all brothers and sisters. Ethnic religions, on the other hand, have this like internal address. This religion is enclosed and it doesn't send out missions because it makes no point, because the secret is something only we share and they have to be introduced to become part of the tribal community. And ethics is bad because it's um, ethnocentric. So the, the highest good is what's good for my tribe. So if I steal a cow from another tribe, it's a good thing. But if I were to steal that cow from my native, from my next door neighbor, then it's a bad thing. So let me give you an example. We distance ourselves from what happened in Rwanda years ago where Tutsi and Hutu applied these particular methods. And on top of that, they knew if I don't kill you, you're going to kill me. So I'm going to kill you first. But then the Balkans in the 1990s, we don't need to look far. Uh, let's have Northern Ireland as an example. There are other places as well, and there are religious motivations behind the ethics. And in Poland, this is the failure of um, Christian education, and that's coming from me, uh, a Christian priest. It's more about the ecocentric ethnic rather than universal. We love to have our parties and groups and our own backyards. The same goes for the church. So he's from this radio and he's from this magazine, so we can fight one another, and it's like a life or death situation. No such thing as inclusivity 
are allowing you your own view. Be you're different, you're my enemy. And I think that this is the disaster or a failure of the universal values. The uh, teachings we provide at schools, we're not doing a good job, job of that. I don't think it was the best of ideas. And then the Polish mentality enjoys games like this where we have two tribes, at least two tribes fighting, because it's tribal ethics, there is no place for respect. It's about fighting one another, which makes it really difficult to overcome. And then there's religious mentality, the model of Polish Catholicism. I'm afraid it's mostly about Polish national Catholicism, really a tribal one. That's our view of things. We, the Polish people, for the rest of Europe, we will be the role model of Catholicism, and the West will spoil us. I mean, who can come here like a migrant or someone of different views? Can they come over and take our faith away from us? If this is what we believe, this makes our faith really weak. So by watching these ethnocentric behaviors, that's when we can um, make up our, our minds. And if we want to overcome this, then we have to go all the way to the gospel where we say, I invite everyone, and if you're not our enemy, then you're one of us. Obviously, that's history, and that's a minimum, it's a basic requirement, but it's not so easy to uproot. When I checked a sociological study about um, YouTube priests and, and how much, uh, what their ratings are, because they have their own ch um, channels, we have Father Shostak, who is more of a performer. He's number seven or eight on the ratings list, even though he's a fantastic storyteller using um, the language of the young. But we have uh, priest Natanek, and he's ahead of him, and he's been excommunicated. He's been excluded, but he says, Christ is the king of Poland. You just need to touch the screen, and you'll be healed. The other priest has a, a bubble theology. It's a magical story. Like you have to have a magical gesture, just like Shakespeareovsky. Um, touch the screen and you'll be healed or your mother or your girl will love you. Your girlfriend will love you or your boyfriend will love you. I am quite alarmed by this. But I'm afraid it's also the basis of the lack of respect that you can see in the media and public life. And when you have a dialogue within the church as well, that's a sad observation of mine. Now here's the question. Can we change the order or do we go one by one? Okay, because I'm a sixth year student, I can say that at the university, I've learned to draw very complicated anatomical structures using crosses, dots, and circles. But it's also taught me to stay minimal. So what I'm going to say is that uh, my first um, responses, uh, reaction, exclamation mark. Because it's not just reaction, exclamation mark. I want to give you a story, if I may. So I need to do three things. First, first I want to stress that the story I want to share with you is not to discuss problems at the university, because for that, we are going to have a separate event or initiative. I would also like to explain what the system at the university is, which is that we study in Polish and in English. There are two pillars and how these two groups um, learn. There's very little contact between the two. And if there is any, then we have like liaison people like me who study in English but speak Polish, and that um, keeps the communication up. And also, when you're at university, uh, students, when they take their exams, they will do it uh, on similar dates, but not the same dates. So there's a bit of a shift. And the questions are very similar and sometimes the same. 
And the third question I have to do, I need to ask representatives of the university not to hold a grudge against me because I'm going to say something obvious. Um, my beloved uncle said is that the exchange is a privilege of all the students. Um, the exchange is like a database of old questions. So that's the kind of slang we use at the university. Now on with the story. I was um, at university and I was preparing for an exam. We, as the English division students, held our um, exam a few years before the Polish guys, that's the Polish students. And then and a question came from the Polish students whether halale have put have used the exchange or have they dismissed this? I wouldn't be myself if I didn't write it, because if, if I didn't respond, I wrote. Thank you very much for writing Halala with a capital letter. That's great to see that sort of respect. And they use the word Halal because we have many people from Arab countries. And so until the comment was deleted, and until a few people said, perhaps it deserves a response, well, it was about an hour that passed since then. And except for me, there was no other response, not from the year. And there are some 350 people and some um, people who speak Polish. So here's the question, why was there no reaction? On the one hand, the person who used those words, well, then again, it's say to use. It's better to say halale than harab, which is forbidden. So why? What made that person think that they? It's okay to call us these words, and why didn't anyone else respond? There were just perhaps two or three posts back from my ear, and they would say, "Oh, sorry, don't worry." And I'm happy because no one from my ear found out about this and I decided to keep it to myself. I just don't think that would be a pleasant thing to learn, that this is what our uh, fellow students think. But again, to come full circle, why was there no reaction? Yeah, why not? That's the question. I don't know the answer. Is it fear or is it just a tolerance? Lack of reaction means that it's okay to behave like this or to use words like this. To me, this is disrespectful. So, as I said, the idea for the story is to help me explain why I use the word reaction exclamation mark. Thank you. Professor, over to you. I'm trying to diagnose this case, but I am surprised. And this must be a result of what we've been discussing. I think it came across in the previous interventions. We don't have the models to follow. And what this case shows is there's, as, there's still so much to do until we've built a culture. And it's not just about students, but it's about teachers as well. I'm not trying to wriggle out of this um, answer. You can hardly accept this, can you? But in fact, this is what happens in our society. You call it deficit of respect. Not sure if you can measure this, though, when you look at other countries and nations. I was in, involved in some turbulent discussions Thursday and Friday, and it was about intercultural um, cooperation. We had Swedes, Hungarians, and Polish people involved in the discussion. Uh, politically, it's, it's a strange reality, but 
what it shows is that when we're learning, we're learning together. And it's not just about hard language and hard facts and say that people are machines because we're not and we're each individual, even if we're the subject of an um, of a science. But the the learner learners also learn and we use specific codes and languages, what you can say or you shouldn't say. That way, when we agree this, then this gives better space for cooperation. But I think it will take more than a year or two to learn. It will take years to learn this. And when it comes to Poland, this may take even longer. I was wondering, um, well, I was thinking about the possible causes of this. Perhaps it was there in previous discussions, but I would say that even though for 70 years, between 1949-1989 or 43 years, there was equality, but still um, there's a lot of hierarchy in our society and many of the authorities came top down. I suppose we carry, carried this on from previous centuries. There was always someone else. It was the nobility, then this was the, um, it's, it's the other countries partitioning Poland. For a short period of time, the government was like closer to the people, but it didn't um, take long. So I suppose you, um, this has found its way into our nature and characters. And now that we have such great access to knowledge and freedom, but perhaps these authorities do not meet our expectations after all. And perhaps this is why we get to see these deficits, which could be one of the aspects which is um, also true, perhaps, for academia. There is another element which is not conducive to uh, bridging that gap, that deficit. In the new system, whether it's education or social life, it's not about cooperation, it's about rivalry. Very much so. So we um, we are opponents, not just as different nations, but there is real competition between social groups and even between work colleagues within a group. And our achievements are not really based on our individual achievements. It's more about working as a team. This must be a deficit in our education, and this stops us from um, working with colleagues respectfully. And then, again, if there's this message, strong message coming top down, politically as well, and that's something you get from the media. So I suppose that feeling is even more reinforced. So these are my thoughts and perhaps something we can discuss more later. Okay, so now we'll be talking about uh, prognosis and therapy, but maybe um, anyone of you, the panelists, maybe you want to add something, an extra round. Because I want to say something, to add something. Well, we talk, we're talking about weakness, a weakness which is pretending to be the strength. This is how I understand what Professor has said, all of us, we were talking about it. And I have one optimistic joke, if I may, referring to your joke. I will not use bad words, I promise. But uh, I heard it. Uh, I heard it on the public uh, bus uh, from many years ago. Uh, two gentlemen they discuss who is to take the free seat on a tramway, and uh, the first one says to the other one, "Prego, Mr. Władzio." So a lot of respect. Well, it is Gdansk, Warsaw, possibly is different. Well, so I have a picture here. 
I have a picture of a blown-up uh, person here. If someone blunts up and it's so overwhelming in political um, public uh, sphere, people pretend to be so important. And if they blow up, then they are empty inside. It's not strength, it's the weakness. This is my, uh, this is the picture which is so real to me. Wukash, maybe you will add something because I'm sure you have written something on your piece of paper. What can we do to let this earth down off from such a person so that this blown up things will disappear so that we speak like humans? Well, I'm pessimistic here, I'm afraid. I'm really pessimistic. Because this blown up thing is a part of a process which I call a process of becoming rednecks. All of us. We are prone to kind of erosion. And uh, why, why is it happening? Well, because it's effective. It seems, or it turns out, uh, that the brutality, being redneck, uh, being proud, uh, vi being violent, well, it's effective. It's an effective way to solve problems, uh, group problems, kind of, not universal problem. So I would expect not shifting towards being modest, but towards even higher bloating, being more pompous. You may find a lot of arguments saying for that. My colleagues, ask the representative group of Poles whether they feel uh, hurt or harmed, and if so, who uh, who has hurt them? Well, like, there are many answers. The old system, the new system, the church, Catholic Church, mother, father, a teacher, Germans, Russians, even Jews. And it turned out that no one really was the one who hurt. So who is hurting us? 51% of Poles said that they felt hurt. By whom? By those who have more. So now let us try to find an answer. Why those who have more? Why they evoke such bad, so bad feelings? And step by step, we may uh, discuss it. It's about trust or lack of trust. In global research, we know that the level of social trust in Poland is the lowest in the world, the lowest. It's 20 times lower than in Denmark, for example, unimaginable difference. Only 5% of Poles claim that, people, that, you, that they can trust people. Only 20% of Poles respond that you may trust your friends and family members, 20%. Just look in, uh, in what kind of world we live with no, no trust and what can help it? Control. Control, surveillance, obedience, and so on and so forth. So it is best to have the role of a controllant, to, to control. And to be an effective controller, you need to add a lot of attributes like uh, high positions or this pompousness. It's a very comprehensive problem, I think. Which is why, just like I heard some doubts about our perspectives to get out of this ethnocentric ethics. Well, that's why I have also doubts about our possibilities to get out of this, because it pays to be a redneck. 
Well, I remember Amos Oz, an Israeli uh, writer. He had uh, lectures which were published, and the title was How to Cure a Fanatic. Great reading. And the key word there is compromise. Compromise, which is believed to be rotten, it's a weakness when you want to strike a compromise. And Amos Oz, who has lived there in Israel, well, he, he does not live anymore, he died recently, but he lived many years in Israel, huge part of his life. Uh, he has Polish roots. And he said that a compromise is not a weakness, it's the way to survive. Palestine and Israel, they have to strike compromise. They live together on one piece of land. And if they didn't have this compromise attitude, they wouldn't have chance to survive. They would have killed one another. Well, I'm afraid the history is developing in this way now. And uh, what is his diagnosis for this pompousness? Well, a fanatic is pompous. They know best. And they will fight the enemies with no compromise possible. And Amos Oz says, you should have distance to yourself and sense of humor. A fanatic has no sense of humor. It's easy to, that's why you can recognize them. If you don't have at least a bit of self-irony, then you have no chance to stop being fanatic. I think it's a very good uh, prescription diagnosis also. But it's not an answer to how you can cure a fanatic because it, it seems that fanatic is uncurable if we follow these logics. Well, you don't have any golden rule what to do about it, but if you... If we try to soften up this kind of attitude, so the first step would be to tell them to have distance to themselves. Right, so how can we cure a fanatic? Do we, can we find this uh, answer? Once I had a pleasure to talk to Amos Oz, I made an interview with him, and he told me, okay, we have different opinion, one religion, with another, we are fighting about Messiah. Maybe we should wait a little bit. He will come and he will say, welcome, or he will say, welcome again. And he was right. And it's really reasonable but how to convince uh, these other people that maybe it's worth uh, waiting and listen to what Messiah would say. I remember this beautiful uh, Jewish uh, sentence, a messiah is a messiah, you have to wait. Okay, so it seems really sad, and about this glass which may be half empty or half full, it's a huge field uh, to operate, it's, the situation is so bad, so we can do a little thing and then it, the situation will uh, get improved. So where can we start from? The priest has come up with uh, uh, humor as one cure, self-irony, but I'm not sure it will work on the other side. So what shall, shall we start? Marta, maybe you will try. I do not have this sad uh, diagnosis. I don't know, maybe it's my self-defense. I don't know. But I'm really optimistic. I see Mariana Palinder in the second row, Gdansk Center for Equal Treatment, Gdansk, Pomorze. Poland is full of people who are really great. I'm not a researcher. I don't know all the results of the research, all these per percentages. Being pompous, well, the first receipt to the, uh, the first uh, prescription is to try to equal others on an equal um, basis and education. I don't want to say obvious things, but what we are trying to do, we in the office, well, we want to provide systemic attitude to education, including equal education, and not like one-off uh, program, one-off course. We organize a school. We are talking about standards. In, uh, we are telling students what they have right for, and uh, we want to talk about good future to all the students, that this is something which has to be done. I'm sorry I interrupt you, but uh, what do we do? Do we want to show what kind of resources we have, where we can appeal to where we have this hope? 
I believe we agree with you, but what should be strengthened? Well, people have it. And the diagnosis were, on the one hand, above this halali, halale. Don't cry over something which may be Britannia. We don't know whether it was about prejudice. We don't know whether it was translated into discrimination practices. If not, then, well, we have this trap of over-political correctness. We should not really be doing it. It's a longer discussion, I suppose. And, and this humor, I think sometimes we should remember about high dialogue, about humor. We should be discussing and not uh, and not uh, force ourselves not to say certain things. In my work, in my cooperation with um, public officers in the region, I. I don't need really to look for certain things in people. I can only encourage them to be more active. I can work in the uh, zone of Russian language so that it's easier to talk to people from Ukraine to have a better bridge with them. But it's not that people don't understand it, that they don't see separation, that they don't understand what discrimination is about. They do. And now getting back to the border, well, we have many people who help um, others on the border who live there, and they don't turn back to what's happening there on the border. And the uh, border control, they see this dilemma. They uh, they take leaves so because they don't want to participate in the genocide, as some uh, call it. So I'm not over-pessimistic then. I rather see lack of coordinated plans. We need to understand what we want to do, what kind of result we want to achieve, who do we, who we want to work with. We need to make small investments into partnership and making all of us um, uh, anchored in what we want to do. So we should not read research, right? We should live in Gdansk, and we should believe that people are good, right? These three things. Professor. Ah, professor, proszę bardzo. I'd begin with a brief remembering some research. And we asked people about simple things, really. We asked them to individually answer to how are you similar to Adolf Hitler? None was the answer. And to what extent are you similar to a cloud? And they were looking at us as if we were crazy. How can you be like a cloud? When we told them that in 90% water uh, is in cloud, that uh, the cloud is made in 90% of uh, water and in us, then they were looking at us as if we were crazy. So when we were asked about differences, when after that we asked them about differences, how are you different from Adolf Hitler? The list of differences was um, very long. In other words, I would suggest a need to rebuild our natural aptitude to being different. It is important that we want to be different because it is how we build up our identity. But once we have developed our identity, then we don't need it anymore. And um, at the university, and we need to learn to look at the world of people, animals, from the perspective of similarities. And why is it so important? 
It's not hundreds. We have thousands of psychological research how important are consequences of perceived similarity. Well, to begin with, this is the readiness to help. The similarity, the, the probability that we help someone grows with how similar this other person is. We uh, like to help people who are similar, not ones who are different. It's about empathy. It's about understanding what other people um, experience. It's also about uh, liking other people. And also, perceived similarity will make us stop ourselves from being aggressive, even if we are angry. So we have breaks. The perceived similarity is, uh, can stop us from aggressiveness. And we know that if children of the adults, if they made aware that they are similar to other people, then the prejudice would uh, be reduced dramatically. So we see a long list of good results of perceived similarity. However, it requires reflection, so that the, because we notice differences kind of automatically, but to notice similarity, we need to think for a while. It's not an impulse, it's a reflection. And I would perceive here an option for change, possibility for change, to, uh, well, uh, education procedures, socialization procedures, and also social procedures. We should be having this idea of searching for similarity. To what extent are we similar to one another? If we understand that a cucumber, a simple cucumber, and we, we have 50% of the same genes, then it uh, speaks for itself. And, well, the similarity between people, even better. Well, I remember one experiment uh, in genetics, DNA research. You might have heard about it. There is this portal, Mamondo, and to a group of 100 people, um, short uh, documentary video, they have collected candidates, like um, a lot of different people, Arabs, Jews, nationality divided as we are today. Uh, about belonging to states or um, citizenship, and they were looking uh, not trusting one another, different races, and in a month, a month after that, when the DNA uh, uh, test, the results of DNA test have been uh, revealed, uh, you, this Israeli uh, boy who was looking with no trust to an Arab girl, he learned that together, like we with cucumber, they have 80% of similar genes. Well, they are, uh, they come from the same region, Arabs and Jews. So this is really fantastic that now we have noticed similarity, all of us. We come from the same mother and father, we can say so, symbolically. And you really disarm a person, you disarm this tension from a person when you say that the other, uh, well, we don't know this person, so he's an enemy. Um, and uh, when I talk about Islam, um, I uh, have my lectures at universities and in the preschool, it happened, for some years it, it is like that, that there are some candidates. I, I teach at third year. In the very beginning, they want to discuss on Koran and, and Islam. They have quotes ready, and it's a problem, because they don't want to listen, to listen, because they know that it's a crime type of, um, and, uh, and violent type of religion, and they have quotes, if I try, to select some nice quotes from the Bible, and I tell them who does not uh, hate uh, to, they, they are not, um, they, they, they have, they're not worth me, 
It's not love. It's a lot of aggression and hatred. Well, Bible is full of such quotes. So it's about methodology. Iran's experience a weird situation with a young person at the third year of theological studies. And then I brought a copy of the Quran in Arabic and put it uh, and asked someone to open it. Nobody really wanted to come up. And I, uh, I select one person, I've chosen one person, and I asked him to uh, operate uh, objectively against a uh, volume. And uh, this, uh, this student put the, took this um, uh, Koran uh, through the uh, fabric. And I asked him, why are you so fanatic? And he told me that he worked as a cook in Hamburg. And two Arabs were owners, were owners in this restaurant, and they treated women badly. So he knows that Arabs are bad. And when I talk to young people, and they say, well, maybe youngsters are most open, but sometimes they say, oh, this Muslim, the, the, the Islam, uh, Islamist, well, actually, this, even this word has a terrible notion, uh, notion is perceived negatively. But I tell them, but you have, in your classroom, you have a little Ahmed from Chechenia. Oh, yeah, but he's tamed. He's ours. He doesn't kill. He doesn't have any bomb in his backpack. So try to meet others and you will understand that the situation will be similar. So we have to tame this kind of situation. I like this search for similarities because all of a sudden this armor drops off and you have no one to fight against. So I think the diagnosis may be optimistic, that, optimist, that education uh, going away from media cliché when we have the simplified and false message. If I were to say something to replace classes in religion and religion um, science, it would be much easier to grade students. Plus, educationally, that would be a very good lesson for everyone, all of us. I think we should all know about other cultures and religions with the world becoming denser and denser, and we don't get that. Well, I don't think the, um, the other priests think that. Well, can I just uh, explain something? Uh, hate speech, uh, contempt and prejudice studies show that young people are not more tolerant, tolerant. On the contrary, on the contrary, yes, on the contrary. Because what we find is that the older people get, the less they use hate speech, and young people use it more. On top of that, especially with young people, the uh, propensity to use hate speech and to be in contact with hate speech, it supports um, active violence. So here's a warning I have. Don't be um, fooled. Um, we don't have tolerant youth. I don't think so. And I've been following this for years with my students. The shift to the right is increasing. There's political fanatism among students, and I can see this growing. It's so alarming, but that's just as a side remark. The only reason why I said that is because I probably live in a good bubble with young people. Okay, so it's been the prognosis and therapy all mixed up, but let's not get overly attached to this. Instead, let's talk about the good stuff. I mean, something to console us? I am just being more optimistic. I think because it's therapy, I would like to go back to what the professor here said. We talked about narcissism, and narcissist will not allow anyone to hurt them because they're in love with themselves and they appreciate the values they have. And so they will not allow others to hurt them. Now, if we can make the narcissist believe that they should help others as well, let's start with the family. I suppose the narcissist might react if 
bad things were to be said about their brothers and sisters. And then you continue with this and go further and further up until you're in a perfect world. And this would apply to everyone on earth. If we could do this, we could possibly eradicate hate. But there is another thing, something that I uh, picked up. A lot of young people are struggling hating themselves because of their inferiority complexes. As an example, like a woman um, doesn't want to put on weight. I, how can I have eaten that piece of cake? I was supposed to say to stay slim to fit into my dress for New Year's Eve party. The question might be, if this is what uh, crops up in your head, would you say that to your own daughter or to someone else? Would you say that to your cousin, like, aren't you stupid? You looked at the piece of cake and you had a little bit of it. Why would you do it? So that way we can try and be more objective by taking a step back and to treat ourselves as a child or someone you want to look after or you want to um, give them love. This could be helpful and this might be recommendable. It's not just about uh, liking yourself but liking others as well. It's about to, to respect yourself, yes, respect yourself and others. So, at this point, there is a bit of a stigmatized quote from the Bible. Not sure if it's a direct quote. Perhaps you could help me to love your brother like you would love yourself. If we started to follow this, we might really be closer to this omnipresent love and respect. Professor, can you hold on because for a moment, I think we have Marta. Okay, over to you, Professor. I understand we're not at therapy yet. Yes, we are. Yes, we are moving smoothly into therapy. So ways to treat in this case, perhaps there aren't any. And instead, perhaps uh, we can leave it to time. If intended, then you can hardly expect changes like through a decree, and this will create respect. Probably not. But the subtitle of this part of our debate is also about resources. What can we use? What's there to help us? And what can we expect? in different spheres of our lives. How can we reintroduce the culture of respect or how can we uh, bridge that gap? My first thought is the system of power in Poland. I mean, it might sound like a cliche, but you always follow the example from the higher levels. And we have just short spells of democracy in our country. And it's that democracy that builds respect for minorities or for those who are excluded or perhaps less equal. And I suppose that's the essence of the democracy which we built after the atrocities of both world wars. We were building the democracy, it's still young, it's still not quite mature, and so we talk about lack of a political discourse. And this really translates not just into um, disrespecting you, the people you talk to, uh, into disrespecting them, um, but it's, it's disrespect for other social groups. So we have to make choices. Um, it's good to have hope. And that hope is that we should stay within that sphere of values where individual dignity is the utmost value as opposed to the dignity of an unidentified set of 
individuals, because I think this is a straight road to fascism. So that's the first resource we can build on. The second resource is our system of education. And I'm talking about um, the system of education, both at the primary and secondary and tertiary level. I think they've been some, some gains have been made in the recent years. There has been some critique um, regarding the teachers and university teachers, but I think the system has become more autonomous and we have good examples showing that schools have been successful building communities. And if you allow them to do their thing, and, and if you're not oppressive, and if you support the autonomy of these organizations, things can only get easier. There is a third resource, especially in our country, something really important, and that's the church and its role in society. Every week, prayers, um, there are um, sermons are preached, um, there are meetings in churches, and they address a big number of um, our natives. So that makes it an important resource. And if the church um, follows its, its mission and asks for respect for everyone plus respect for work, a lot of times we say we, um, those that have more than us uh, are considered not so good. But if we can change this, we can also hope to uh, increase our trust in those that are better off financially or perhaps um, are in a stronger position, not because of their formal authority, but because they are trustworthy and they are respectable people. Number four, that's about our will to deal with the deficit of respect uh, in relation to minorities. You could say this is a meeting point of the migration crisis and the demographic crisis in our country. And so we will have to um, embrace migration. Uh, that's not something we're really discussing. We have many people coming from Belarus, from Ukraine, from Asian countries. That's not something that's commonly discussed. People don't want to uh, have that discussion in the media. But there is this demographic crisis or even demographic trends in our country. And if we want to grow at a similar pace, we will have to welcome more people from outside Poland. You could say that it's both a threat, but it's also something that will force us as, into change. And that change should include our schools and, uh, and how we uh, treat those that will come over here. Apparently, there are 100,000 Ukrainians in Wrocław. Have you heard that? That's just incredible, the numbers. OK, let's do the following. We have a special slot for you. And if you'd like to ask questions or share an observation, or just let us know what you think, then um, collect your thoughts now and we will use this time to talk some more. We have this um, board in front of us. How about one word that we think will be the therapy? My handwriting is terrible, so can someone take over from me? Hopefully there will be some volunteers to write down the words. So as you gather your thoughts, um, the audience that is, Let's have a discussion. We've heard this um, Semitic um, motive here. There is this picture. It makes me so emotional. It dates back to 100 years ago. There are two men there, um, a man and a boy. At a time when um, inequality was even bigger than today, and there was very little respect. So what's in that picture is an older man and a boy. 
and I will tell you later who that was. The caption says there, a young poet is reading his poems to his colleague. colleague. So that young poet was Ozjasz Płocki. He was a guy from Nalewki, terrible poverty, uneducated, etc. That was his background. The colleague was Janusz Korczak. And at the time, he was a teacher um, for a summer camp. So that's when those poems were written. In addition, Janusz Korczak wasn't a big fan of poetry. He did like Adam Asnik, perhaps. Perhaps not the best of uh, tastes. And in his publication, he refused to print children's poems. He thought that was just mimicking older um, people. But all of a sudden, here's this. And I'm really moved when I think about this. So if that was possible back then, it's possible today. So that's my intervention. So that's both a resource and a hope from me. And my thoughts are that perhaps we should listen to the people who actually do it. And we have such people and have such stories in the Polish culture. There are references to individualism. And when there is a community, then we um, fight armed against Germans or uh, Soviets. So these are the stories about community. But there are other community stories. There are loads of them, but they've been forgotten. So this is where I'm building my hopes up. I think this is possible. The people out are there and the stories are there. And we can build on that. A very wise and valuable suggestion, I believe, from you. However, this is a slow process, just like with Mao Zedong, slowly, slowly, slowly. But there is um, a message of hope there. Let me give you two examples. You might think that there are no connections here. Forty years ago, I was a member of a neighborhood group. And um, we would look after our children one by one. So there were seven kids that I would take to the sandbox. A lonely man, a single man with seven kids uh, that he's uh, taking to the sandbox. You will understand that I wasn't considered um, a, a deviant. That's what they thought I was, and that's how they treated me. Now, see the streets today and see how many men are there pushing um, the uh, strollers. So what's changed? Well, it was um, small steps, one by one, gradual dissemination of certain behaviors. Here's my second example. It's about the city of Sopot. When I first moved to Sopot 20 years ago, sometime later, I was stopped in the street by the mayor of Sopot, Mr. Karnowski, and he asked me, how do you like it here? I like everything here, with one exception. What would that be? And I said to him, well, every street in the Sopot could have the name of Dog Poo. Well, 20 years ago, indeed, the streets of Sopot, well, there was dog poo everywhere. I don't want to go into the details. But anyway, today, it's a different story. Not, not perfect, but it's different. Something has changed, but it took 20 years. And the change came because new behaviors and new patterns of behavior emerged as well as disapproval for certain behaviors. They are simple and discrete mechanisms, nothing revolutionary, definitely not. But longer term, they can actually make good change. My thoughts are also that 
to have at the back of, of your head um, a magic word. To me, that magic word was implanted in my head by my mother. Whatever the occasion, um, and there were many difficult and dramatic times, she would always say, he's a human after all, just like you. That's something we do not appreciate. This is um, a, a banal thing, but it's so powerful where people realize that this person is human, whether you're poor or rich, whether you're from Iran or from Germany, you're um, human after all. And so to keep reminding ourselves of this is important. It does good things in our heads and it does good things to how we behave. Now, very quickly, I want to refer to what you have said about narcissism and this individual uh, blame or responsibility. I'm for putting it, putting it up to an institutional level and think how our attitudes may be translated into practices. So I believe we need a very deep work for democracy on the local level. A lot has to be done there. And this availability or the feeling of um, being included and getting good service from uh, local governments is democracy and it's respect. And we do have tools for that. We have ideas how to do it. I will give you just one example, an analysis of social impact. We are uh, performing climate um, impact uh, analysis, and we can uh, make such an analysis of social impact. We can show what, uh, how what we do may be translated into the welfare of people. So we have institutional mechanisms on how to improve things. And I believe that if someone is treated with respect, is leaving the authority less pompous, with less negative um, attitude to other people. So it's my voice, and I, I believe we have a lot of work to be done. What do you respond to that? Questions, comments? So, okay, I know nothing about the microphone. Oh, I see. We have someone going to you with a microphone. Hello, my name is Grażyna Peszynska-Surmacz. If I may, I will be really stressed if I need to stand up. Oh, we are sitting here, so no problem with that. For many years, I've had those uh, thoughts not that I want to raise myself, but I have really deep thoughts about it. I fully agree. I'm a woman, so I uh, well, I respond better to what these two um, female panelists have said. So first of all, we need to have more respect to myself. We have to start with ourselves. If we fill our jar with respect, with trust, with goodness, then we may be this little drop, each one of us, each individual. We might be this drop which will be changing a rock. Of course, we won't change anything by revolution, even by evolution, but it's not my notion, but I brought it yesterday from Malborg. Uh, uh, Marek Wuglos said that it's involution. It's about involution. You have to begin with yourself. So we begin with ourselves. And I also believe, and I was trying to put together different worlds here at the university. I'm a vet doctor, so I uh, try to combine what's human and what's not uh, human. And uh, it's really close to me, this idea. So respect to every creature, every being. We heard about genes and all of us. Uh, vegetation and uh, animals, we are built up of the same uh, material. If we begin with our awareness, maybe I'm a bit chaotic, I'm sorry. 
So I'm from somewhere and I have a purpose in life. I bring my knowledge and I believe that each one of us should uh, become, I have to become a messenger of a knowledge. And then we are this light. If we learn the respect, then with the knowledge, with this respect, we can go farther and carry on the light, our light. This is what I believe. And I have full respect to other panelists, but um, things like uh, it's going to be education, it's going to be church or a different institution, nobody will do it for us because there are people out there. And these people, these are we. So we need to begin with ourselves. This is what I believe. Thank you very much. Although I have very ugly style of writing, I try to put it down. So involution as a word, let us make such a list, so involution. I'll be putting it down. I wish you to write communication and timing. Communication and taming. And I want to explain what I mean. I don't want to, us to use this word as this tamed Ahmed, as uh, my father has said it. But as for the communication, we hear again. I will get back to Professor has said on Sopot Parks 20 years ago. I come from Warsaw, and although 20 years ago when I was five years old, I could have been in touch with uh, Warsaw. Uh, I could have been in touch with Sopot Park, but I was in touch with Warsaw's uh, parks, and uh, it changed because uh, we, uh, because of the introduction of plastic bags available to everybody, and the situation changed, and this, um, the, the plastic bags, it's a great tool. It's a tool. When we talk about the uh, language of hatred, this is what communication should be for. We need to have communication. And then we need to time patterns of behavior. Another example, I had a apprenticeship in Switzerland, and their relations between patients and doctors is completely different. This is how I looked at it. I was at the emergency ward, and there was a patient with a, with a wound in his leg. Maybe I speak too quickly. No, maybe I'm too old. <laughs> and we approached the patient and doctor who was with me. She said, excuse me, could you be nice enough to show the wound on your leg? And the patient, of course, was eager to show it. And at the end, the doctor said, thank you very much. Thank you very much that you agreed to show the wound on your leg. Maybe I should know throw stones, but I tried this approach in Poland, and I was met with a very confused patient. And the patient and the doctor simply rolled her eyes. Why? Why should we behave like that? But if this patient, although he was confused, maybe, if he um, encountered this kind of situation several times, then he would not be confused. He would be timed with this speech of love and respect. So different standards. So it's about standards, right? But I would add the, the thing which Professor has said, taking the risk and timing the risk that I'm, that I'm a pervert. So, being like a pervert, like, right? They would, they would look at me as if I were a pervert, but then they would understand it and tame it. Okay, deviation, perversy.
A ja teraz chciałem tylko się zapytać odnośnie tego przykładu pacjenta. Dawid spychała, jeden z członków zespołu zaufania, szacunku. I właśnie odnośnie tych naszych haseł. A może to nie jest kwestia braku szacunku, jeśli chodzi o pacjenta. Akurat ten konkretny przykład, przykład bo domyślam się, że chciałaś powiedzieć tutaj bezpośrednio przełożyć relację pacjent-lekarz za granicą, a to, co widzisz w Polsce na taki ogół. Czy to nie jest kwestia przypadkiem jednego z naszych haseł, ale innego? Zaufania? Zaufania do drugiego człowieka, do akurat tutaj w tym konkretnym przypadku do lekarza? Nie wiem, być może to jest też kwestia naszej kultury, czyli zwyczajów. My tu tego po prostu nie mamy jeszcze w zwyczaju. Że tutaj niekoniecznie brak szacunku jakiegokolwiek przewagi w tym przykładzie. A drugą sprawę chciałem tylko poruszyć przy okazji. Państwo, czy uważacie, że jest jakiś punkt pewien w tej, w tej ogólnej kulturze szacunku, zaufania, tolerancji, równości? który powinniśmy, do którego dążymy, który powinniśmy osiągnąć, ponieważ tak myślałem o tym, że jeżeli w ogóle jest jakiś ten punkt szczytowy, to gdzie on jest i czy nie boimy się przypadkiem takiego momentu, e, opisowo mówiąc, zjazdu z drugiej góry, jak już na nią wkroczymy, czyli takiej e, inwersji w sumie tego, co chcemy osiągnąć, czyli przesady tej równości, tolerancji, szacunku do tego stopnia, jak to, no nie wiem, mogę przykład... Which is too much tolerance, too much equality. Just like one example, typical example from movies from the 90s, American movies from the 90s, where you couldn't say anything bad, because... Because they would always reply, sue me. Uh, should we make it a bit longer? Well, it may be longer by like 10 minutes. Maybe you could say something, just one word from each one of you. About these recommendations, I'm asking you for the recommendations. This is what I ask you for. Because you said several things, but which to you is most important? Similarity, okay. Searching for similarities. Uh, science, education, and systemic work, international integration index. It's 40, in, for Poland, it's 40 out of 100. So we have equality on paper only. So let us read the research and let us learn what we can do with the recommendations. Everything is described, we know what we are doing. If you could give just one word, science and science or education and systemic approach. Tools. Uh, curiosity is the word, and I try to justify it with a little um, story. I, uh, I'm always curious about how others experience their religion and their spirituality, and Judaism seems very close to us, but I was really interested in the, uh, in the, uh, in, um, in the one event in uh, Gdansk. I wanted to, we have joint campaigns for those who uh, never reached Europe. And we have in Gdańsk a cemetery of non-existing cementaries. We have uh, all, uh, all uh, fees, people of all religion, and it's um, the moment where we can meet and look at better world. And it's always in November. We meet there. But the sadder uh, feast was that when we uh, started to trust one another, I was invited 
to Jewish Pascha. It was two weeks after our Easter, and we supported uh, Jewish um, commune. I want, we held them to take over a synagogue, and when they could enter the main hall, they organized Pascha. And it was a group of people, of quite, well, elderly people. I was the youngest. No, no, there was one person, a rabbi from New York was younger, but he couldn't speak Polish too well. And when they were to read, to read Haggadah about how um, Israeli uh, left um, Egypt, and he couldn't cope with 19th, year, uh, 19th century translation, and he has his neighbor who didn't have any glasses, and the other neighbor couldn't do it. And I, um, I was reading, a Catholic uh, priest was reading Pascha celebration. I was shaking a little bit. But they had no problem with it, so I was reading it, and I was reading exactly the same as what I was reading in my church two weeks earlier. And I was really happy, so it was really something that we had a lot in common. And this young rabbi had to deliver a speech, and he asked someone to translate it from English. Nobody could do it, I was doing it, so I d did it. And the message at the end was it. It was a story about an old Jew who died and he had two sons who were not uh, praying God. And he said, pray your God and wait for Messiah. And I translated it, that is the wish. So I finished it and I, I said I wanted to add something for myself. We are here similar. You're waiting for your Messiah, for his coming, and we are waiting for a Messiah when he, for him to come back. And we see, well, that there are differences, obviously, but we are really close. And there is no need for us to, uh, to fight one another. And the oldest members of this ceremony, they were telling me about the experience, how they were in hospital with a Russian guy, a German guy, Polish guy, and Jewish guy, and they had the same color of blood, all of them. So it was an important experience to me, and everything started with my curiosity. I was very curious about this uh, festivity. So if we treat it in a symbolic way, and I'm a priest, I can do it, so this is what I would want to have. Thank you. So curiosity. Well, this question, I would say that an absolute top, which we should be aspiring to, is treating your neighbors yourself. So I'm now referring to this religious mantra. And uh, Dariusz asked us to use just one word only. So I was thinking, what kind of word would it be? Just one word. And uh, neighborness, because here we have this form, which evokes different feelings in Polish language. We have different types of difficulties, which we were fighting. Uh, against, we have a past which has not always been so colorful, and respecting it, we are not the only one who had difficult experience. Some other people could have been hurt as well. But still, we should be trying to get into the dialogue. And I think it would be definitely our path to the better world. Professor? I have not expected that I would be saying and uh, saying that much. So I will suggest three words instead, instead of one word. The first one, we heard it in our discussion. It is something that for respect, uh, Dr. Grażyna touched upon it, is openness. So openness to what's different. And it's not like tolerance, but openness which will have to come out of our respect to ourselves and expecting the same from others and giving it to other people. It has to be integrated within you. And the second word I can already see up there, now that we call everything national, I would say that it's uh, 
more of a model than standards. It's something we expect of others and for ourselves, from others, and also from systems. But to me, this is more about ways or models of ethical behavior. It's something that I suggest we should write down, which is the law, because the law is there to support people. People, first of all, although it should equally apply to animals and the environment, but we definitely live in a world of change, but the law is key to ensure that we can build a hard base for how we behave towards others. And when we exceed those lines, then this shouldn't be tolerated, lack of tolerance for um, not follow, following the law, that's really key. And to see this um, should raise objections. Well, we can now see less and less of dog sort of products on the streets of Sopot and Gdańsk. This might be the, propose, the, the effect of ethical models. And your second word, because I lost it, uh, it's already there. I would say uh, models as opposed to standards, and the law is the third word. But generally speaking, I'm an optimist. Even though things are not good today, I think that these are turbulent times we're living in. And you can hardly, um, you know, put out a decree to change things. But if we understand that what we're seeing is bad, then we're going to work to make things good. Despite what we see and what we hear, I'm still an optimist. Yes, very quickly from me, uh, a short comment, the switch from standards to models. That's a phenomenal thing, if I may um, say that it's good. I mean, a standard is something normal, it's something that we have now, and a model is something you want to achieve, which again means that we still have some way to go to make it good. Okay, I will have a proposal myself, but you go first. Yes, can I just add to what the priest said? Curiosity is what he said, and Grażyna said, um, is just with every drop you uh, drill the rock. So, curiosity uh, leads to cognition, and cognition means leads to understanding. It happened to me this year as well. I went to Krakow for three days, me and my friend, and we were doing some sightseeing. We went to Kazimierz to a synagogue, Museum of Judaism. And so I started uh, looking at the different exhibits, and I realized all of a sudden that I have no knowledge about this, and that encouraged me to learn more and to understand. And so I bought mezuzah. I wonder if you know what this means. So that's to instill some curiosity in you. Do you know the word? Can I just add, to finish up, this could be a good quote to summarize several themes. I would also add, it is possible. Not sure if this is uh, the essence. It's one of, perhaps, it's something that was there, we can do it. And here's this beautiful quote. These are um, holy, secular words. I'm going to read it out to you in a moment. And this comes from Przegląd by Korczak. So children would write those texts, but he would contribute to that as well. And this is something profound and beautiful. 
Christ. And it's right on topic. In the previous issue, says Korczak, we included a photograph of a letter. And Shimon apologized to Leon. And at least there's one quarrel less in the skull in Poland, in Warsaw, in Europe, in the world. Because even in the world and on the moon and on the stars, everywhere there is one anger less and uh, one insult or one offense less. Isn't it nice to think that in the world there are a hundred billion angers? So one and lots of zeros. One and eleven zeros. That's important. A hundred billion of angers. But Leon and Shimon made up, and things have changed. It's 100, 0, 0, 0, minus 1, underlined, and it's 11 nines. Incredible. And things change. 100 billion minus 1 is 99, 9, 9, 9, 9, 9. Right, and here comes the end. They were zeros, and now it's nines. Zero is nothing, and nine is a lot, right? These are holy, secular words. Uh, I hope you're not going to protest. And so educational. And it gives hope, because it shows that I can do it. It's up to me. Okay, let's finish. Walker, anything you want to say? Okay. Uh, thank you very much to everyone. Thank you to Jacek Kaczmarek and his team because they put together this beautifully. They put in a lot of hard work. And it was great being here. And hopefully uh, we haven't spoiled this. Thank you so much. We appreciate. Thank you very much to all the speakers for accepting the invitation. Especially we do understand how busy you are. So many duties. I have a short text which is going to be stopped with an even shorter ceremony. If I may, I'd like to finish this debate like this. Thank you very much to the panelists. Thank you to Mr. Bigda, Mr. Bogalski, Mr. Łukaszewski, Mr. Niedautowski, Ms. Siciarek and Ms. Sokolewicz. Thank you very much for accepting our invitation and for your inspiring exchange of thoughts and experiences and the multi-aspect approach to respect. We have to talk about the important stuff because we don't want them to become any less important in our daily lives. And now I would like to invite uh, the Vice Rector, Professor Bigda, to uh, hand over some souvenirs to all the speakers to remind them of our university. Nie pokażemy państwu, żeby państwo nie, nie wzbudzać w państwa niskiego uczucia zazdrości. <laughs> We're not going to show you. We don't want you to feel jealous or envious. So this debate um, brings to a close a 12-month campaign of culture of respect, which is not to say that this is the end of our work to uh, strength and culture of respect at this university. The outcomes will continue and they will get extra support from other activities, especially those that we've planned as part of our year
of um, intercultural integration communication. We had the first morning coffee meeting, which um, inaugurated the series, and there will be 70 other meetings involving the different parts of our university. This is part of Welcome to Poland um, program of the National Academic Exchange Agency. On behalf of the team, thank you very much to all those present here and those that were following this event online. The recordings of the Polish and English version of the debate will be soon made available in the electronic media of the Gdańsk Medical University because it's an important message and we want it to reach as many listeners as possible. And finally, a very big thank you to my colleagues and team members who were involved in preparing this debate. Thank you for your enthusiasm, professionalism, and harmonious cooperation. This is always a guarantee of success. And to everyone here, stay in good health and all the best. Thank you. Goodbye.